All right, let's get started. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome today's speaker. It's uh, Ben Hao Wan from Vanderbilt University. And uh, uh, before he starts talking, let me remind everybody. So, as usual, uh, when uh, the speaker starts speaking, uh, please put yourself on mute. Uh, when you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask a question. That's how it always works. After the talk is over, you don't have to disappear right away. We'll usually uh, have a uh, an extended informal discussion when people can chat with each other after the talk. And with that said, I'm pleased to uh, uh, in, uh, once again introduce today's speaker. It's Wen Hao Wan from Vanderbilt University, and he is going to tell us something about the functions of finally presented metabolian groups. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for everyone uh, for coming, and thank you for inviting me. So today uh, I'm going to talk about something about uh, the 10 functions of finally presented uh, metabolian group. And I will, I, I will try to convince you why this is interesting uh, to, to study. So the talk, uh, we have five different parts for the talk. So uh, first I will introduce what is the 10 function and what, uh, what's the application of the 10 function. And then I will get into a topic about the 10 function of the class of group I interested in uh, which is finally presented in metabolian group. And for the third part, uh, we know that the metabolian group forms a variety. So we can define the relative free group on the, on the metabolian groups, also the relative presentation. So we can carry all the thing we studied for the finally presented in metabolian group into the variety. So we can talk about the relative dumb function. And we will discuss a little bit about the relative dumb function. And for the fourth part, I will sketch my main proof and tell you why the result look like this. So why we have such result. Uh, finally, uh, I will discuss some interesting open problem in this area. Okay. So first, uh, one of the motiva motivation of the, the Dunn function is the word problem. So say uh, you have a group which is generated by a set X uh, may not be finite. And we can always have a subjective homomorphism from the free group generated by the same set onto G. So the world problem asks, uh, if give you a reduced world, which means we cancel all the consecutive X, X inverse. So give you a reduced world until if this image is one, basically if this, this world is a represent identity inside G. So it asks us to find an algorithm to solve the word problem, you input a word and tell you yes or no. So yes, if it is identity, no is uh, it's otherwise. So let's see. Okay, so one way to think about uh, the word problem, uh, we introduce something called the Dunn function. So, uh, but we restrict ourselves in our the finite presented group. So we define the Dunn function as finite presented group. Uh, and also the word problem can be asked for any group you can be infinite related, also you can be infinite generated. But here we restrict ourselves into a finite presented group to discuss the Dunn function. So let's say we have a presentation of the group, which, uh, which both of them are finite. So I, I should add, add that. So both of them, the cardinality is finite. Uh, then we can talk about, okay, if a word W represents identity, if and only if it can be written as a product of a conjugate of the relators. So here is a relator. Also, we add the plus or minus one. So in case you have the inverse of the relator. But anyway, you can write the word into the product of conjugates. And this equality is true in the free group generated by the X, the set X, which means from the right hand side, so from the right hand side, if we cancel all the consecutive pair of x, x inverse, something like that, everything we cancel, everything, reduce everything, we will recover w. So exactly like letter by letter w. Okay, and then we define the area of this world. So if a world is one, represent the identity, and we can define the minimal number of case such that th this equality exists. So such that we can have some representation of w into a conjugate a product of conjugates. Then this minimal number, we'll call it an uh, area uh, with respect to the presentation, obviously, because this is defined with respect to the presentation or the relators and generators. So the Dunn function with respect to the, this presentation 
uh, we will be defined it to be the the maximum area bounds by words which represent identity and of length that's all equal to n so it's a maximum area uh, a word can bound with the restriction on the length okay so now we have uh, defined the then function with respect to the presentation but 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 in practice uh, we would like to just concentrate on the uh, asymptotic behavior of such function so we don't we're not very interested in explicit um, representation of the expression of the then function so we have we define such equivalence relation which uh, comes from the uh, partial order so if f, f is asymptotically bounded by g if every uh, if there is such there exists a constant number such that f of n is less or equal to c times g of cn plus cn plus c for all n for all natural numbers so we say that fg are equivalent if uh, both f is asymptotically bounded by g and g is asymptotically bounded by f okay so What's nice about this, uh, this equivalence class? First of all, it can distinguish function like n and n log n. So it is strictly like the n is strictly bounded by uh, n and log n times log n. So it's not equivalent, but uh, it is equivalent for polynomial. So if the uh, n to the d is equivalent to n to the k, if and only if d is equal to k. So for the polynomial of the same degree under this equivalence class, they are the same. Also, uh, for the exponential function with different base, uh, it also the same, like two to the n is equivalent to three, uh, three to the n, also equivalent to any c to the n for c greater than zero. So that's nice. We can like, we can just talk about the asymptotic behavior of the function under this uh, equivalence class. So uh, Gromov proved that uh, if G is a finite presented group and with two different finite presentations, let's say P, P prime, uh, their then function with res respect to its presentation is a, uh, are equivalent. So with this, uh, we can prove that, okay, or we can, we can define the then function of the group. So no longer uh, depends on the presentation. Then function of the group to be the then function of its uh, any of its finite presentation. So actually, moreover, this then function uh, is also invariant, uh, is a quasi-isometric invariant. So it is preserved under quasi-isometry. Uh, okay, so, so let, let us say some results uh, for the uh, for then function. So the first one, uh, I said one of the motivations, the word problem. So uh, two computer scientists, uh, Madeline and Otto, they prove that a finite presented group has a decidable word problem, which means uh, there exists an algorithm to tell if a word is one. If and only if the then function is bounded above by a recursive function. So for the recursive function, you can think just like some, some computable function. We can always have an algorithm to compute. Okay, so the next, thing, uh, next result I want to say is, uh, is proved by Gromov also, like one of the, one, a part of this um, detailed proof provided by Osh Osh Oshensky and many others. So a finite generated group is hyperbolic if and only if it's sub uh, it has subquadratic then function. So which means its then function is uh, asymptotically bounded by n squared, also not equivalent to n squared. And you might know that uh, this is also equivalent to it has linear then function. So it's the same as saying a, a group has linear then function or it has a linear then function, uh, sorry, subquadratic function. So there is no other then function between the linear function and quadratic function. But that's an, another different topic uh, about like which, which function can be then function. Okay, the third result uh, is by Brillison. So he proved that uh, if G is a fundamental group of a compact uh, compact Riemannian manifold, and then uh, the then function of G is equivalent to the smallest as a parametric function on its universal cup. So as a parametric function basically tells you uh, how much area it can bound with given length of the loop. 
and the time function in the smallest. Okay, so next uh, I want to talk about the, the class of group I'm interested in. So the class of group I'm interested in is the meta plane group and the group is meta billion. If it's derived subgroup, G prime is a billion. So it's generated by all the commutators and it is a normal subgroup. So, and it has many interesting properties. Uh, I, I will introduce you a few of them, which, is, which are useful for our proof. And also you can establish like what is the, what the term function looks like, uh, sorry, what the meta being group look, looks like. So the first uh, is that uh, the finite generated meta being group are residually finite. So it actually, all the finite generated meta being group is group, uh, is matrix group. So it can be right as a matrix over commutative ring, or you can be right as a matrix over a finite product of fields. Uh, but, but one consequence of this is if it is residually finite, we can have a solvable work problem. So there is an algorithm called McKinsey algorithm to solve uh, specifically for the work problem for a residually finite group. So we have nice, uh, so actually, so the work problem is solvable for, for finite, finite generated meta groups. And actually the conjugacy problem also solvable. Uh, the next uh, property I want to say is uh, the finite generated meta group satisfies the maximum condition for normal subgroups. So what is the maximum condition for normal subgroups? It basically is the same as any properly ascending chain of a normal subgroup is finite. So it's also the same as you can think about uh, giving any normal subgroup of it, it always a normal closure of a finite set. So you can always be right, uh, written as a normal closure of a finite set. So that's interesting. And also it's one of the uh, key factors in our proof. Uh, the third one is, uh, is, is a result by Barry Strable. So they introduced a geometric invariant, which distinguishes a finite presented metabolic group from the others. So this invariant can tell you if you, you, if you give me a finite generated meta group, I can tell you if this is finite presented. Okay, so that's very nice. That's a, also an important part of our proof because we want to compute the done function for the finite presented group. But first we should have, we should know which group is finite presented. Okay, the last one is proved by Bomsog. So it says that a finite generated meta group can be embedded into a finite presented meta plane group. So what, it, what interesting about this is I would say, first, uh, if you recall the Hickman embedding theorem, it says that any recursively uh, generated group can be embedded into a finite presented group. But here basically we add one restriction on the groups. So we call, we restrict it to the meta plane group. So actually it is very well this, this statement true. So if you replace a meta plane group by other variety, uh, usually it will not be true unless the trivial case, okay. So, so let's see some examples. So what, which, uh, let's see some examples. The first one is uh, people's favorite, uh, bombs are solid group. So for the meta plane bombs are solid group, bombs are solid group if one of them is one. So the BS1K, has presentation uh, generated by two elements and A conjugate by T is A to the K, where K is greater or equal to two. So the then function of this group is uh, exponential. So for the upper bound of this, you can just prove directly by solving the world problem. So you can prove for the upper bound, you can always cause exponentially many relation to reduce the world to one. And for the lower bound, you can use some technique called Van Kampen diagram. So you, the, the basically if it's a geometric thing, uh, you can investigate, which we call like the T-band and to say that, okay, at least you must have two to the N uh, relations in your world. If you want to represent uh, your world into the conjugates of relations. Okay. 
So that's the bump size solid group. So next, uh, next example is uh, what I call is a bump size group, which is also funded by uh, is funded by bump size. So the first group is is called gamma, uh, which is generated by three anabans A, S, T, uh, where the relators are uh, A commutes with A conjugate by T, S commutes with T, and A conjugate by S is equal to A times A conjugate by T. So uh, what is interesting about this group is it contains a normal subgroup of Z risk product of Z. So this is a normal subgroup inside the, the bump size, size group. Actually, this group is the first example of a finite presentative group contains a normal abelian subgroup of infinite rank. So, and if we add one more relation, so if we say, okay, we add the A to the M equals one. So we just add one restriction on A, uh, it becomes a new class of group, uh, gamma M. And gamma M, you might think, you might guess, it contains a copy of Z risk product, uh, ZM risk product of, with Z. And where this group actually is an amplifier group. So if you're familiar with lambda group, you will recognize, okay, this contains a copy of lambda group. The then function of the first gamma, the, the, the bump side group is two to the n. So it, it is exponential. And the then function of gamma n is bounded by n squared. So if you add one extra relation, the, the then function just collapse to like polynomial. And it, it is proved by Kasabov and Riley. And if, if the M is a prime number, so say we have gamma P, if P is prime, the term function is a uh, quadratic. So this is proved by um, Cornelia and Tessera. Okay, so that's interesting. And the last class of group I want to, I want to introduce is uh, the semi-direct product of Z to the N with Z. So, so, is this the term function of such group has at most a uh, either oh sorry has either polynomial and or ex exponential term function? So it depends on the action. So actually, so you can say, think okay. So the action of the semi-dual product. So the phi is an element in G L N Z, and its term function is polynomial if the order eigenvalue of the phi is a uh, root of unity. Uh, otherwise, you, you have exponential then function. So this is proved by uh, Bresson and Gerstner. Okay, so here we see many, many examples. So one thing you might notice is that even though we have different uh, metabolian groups, they have like at most exponential function. So as far as I know, uh, all the known examples has at most, uh, have at most exponential function. So one natural question is if we have a uniform upper bound for such for the, this class of function. So also if this upper bound is exponential, uh, that's just the other question we, we will talk about today. So let us first see uh, what happened for other solvable groups. So for a billion group, uh, it's nice. Uh, a billion group, if uh, for a finite generator a billion group, the then function of them is always bounded by n squared. So actually it is equal to n if is Z is cyclic group. And if it is like the torsion free rank is greater than one, uh, the term function is N squared. Okay. And for the solver group of derived length three or higher, uh, there is one theorem by Kalampovic, Miyasnikov, uh, and Sapir. They, they show that if you give any recursive function, any function, recursive function, we can find a relatively finite a finite presented solver group of derived length three with then function greater than F. So basically it means that there is no, no hope to find the upper bound. You can be arbitrary large, the then function can be arbitrary large. So what's the case for meta -bin group? That's the question. If, uh, does it look like uh, the abelian group we can have a uniform upper bound or does it look like the solver group of derived length greater than three? or greater or equal to three. So uh, my theorem just try to uh, answer this question. 
Uh, but before we do that, uh, first, let me just uh, briefly uh, re revisit uh, one group theorem by Barry Stribble. So they classify all the finite presented uh, beta brain group. So let's see uh, if G is a finite generated group and A is a normal subgroup, T is the is quotient, and both of them are billion. Then G is finite presented if and only if A is 10 as a T module. So first, uh, there is a natural module structure on A. So the T just acts on A by conjugation. So we have a, we have exact sequence. And let me just try to explain what is a TAM. So let me write the exact sequence we have here. So here we have exact sequence and A T a billion. And T acts on A by conjugation. Okay. So if we first we say, okay, a, a character or the valuation, uh, some might call, uh, is a chi from the group, the abelian group T to, uh, to the added, added, additive group of, of, of real numbers. So it's homomorphism. So it basically kills all the torsion elements. So what's left just like the infinite order elements. And then we define, okay, if A is a left module, we can define the A star to be the right module with basically the same action, we take the inverse. So if so, the T acts on A on the right by defined to be the T inverse acts on A on the left. So if we have a left module, we can define a right module A star. If we have a right module, uh, we can define a left module A star. So let's see. So if this module is 10, if first of all, the A is finite generated as a T module, so it's generated by a finite many elements. And also there is a finite subset. So let me re highlight this, the finite subset, uh, lambda inside the, so CA and CA star means centralizer. So the centralizer on the module, such that for every non-trivial character, uh, chi, we have such map. So from ZT to R, uh, even though we define the, the character from T to R, we can extend it to uh, element uh, in, in the group ring by setting first, we're setting this is positive infinity if the element is zero. And otherwise we setting the lambda. So for, for any lambda not equal to zero inside the group ring, we define its char So under character, it becomes the, yeah, let's see the, the infimum of the chi takes T where T is inside the support of lambda. So you can think about elements in a group ring as a finite support function from T to, T to Z. So we just, there's just finite many things. We take the infimum. So basically the minimal number as a, as a result of the chi of lambda. But basically it's saying that there is a finite set such that inside the centralizers, such that you give any, uh, any character, we can find one element in this finite set such that uh, the, the result is positive. So we will see, uh, we will see how, how this apply to our theorem uh, later. So that's the theorem by Barry Strabel. So here is my theorem uh, about the 10 functions. So let's say if we have or if we have a finite presented beta brain group, and k to be the minimum torsion free rank of an abelian group T, such that uh, there exists a billion normal subgroup A, uh, satisfying G quotient A is isomorphic to T. So basically, what what is saying is we have a short that sequence like this, where A T a billion and we take the minimum torsion free rank over all such exact sequence, sequences. So there are many, many like sequen exact sequences can be written for G and we take the minimum torsion free rank of T. So if K is zero, uh, the upper bound is N square. So quadratic because in this case, if K is zero, so T will be a finite uh, abelian group. So G is virtually a billion. That's why it, the, the function of it is bounded by n squared. 
So if k is greater than zero, okay, we will have the upper bound is two to the n to the two k. So it, it is a strange number, but I will try to explain why is this number, okay? Why we have such strange thing happen. Uh, the, the two consequence of this, immediately the consequence of this is, let me say the remark. So first we can take A always to be the derived subgroup of T. So we can always take A to be derived sub, subgroup of T. Therefore the T is, is isomorphic to the abelianization of G. And therefore the done function of this is always bounded by this two to the n to the two k if k is greater than zero for the k is a torsion free rank of, of the abelianization. And the second remark is if we choose any function is super polynomial, which means it's always greater than any polynomial function, the two to the n or two to the h of n will be an up uniform upper bound for any uh, done function of finite presented meta plane group. So we, so one consequence of this is we show that uh, uh, there is uniform upper bound for all them function of finite presented meta brain group. Okay. So we will revis revisit this uh, theorem later, uh, but first let me just tell you about all the re uh, relative uh, them function thing. So the the meta brain group form a variety. So which means it satisfy a set of ident identities for meta building group is satisfy this identity. Uh, you will see this also later. So basically you're plugging any four elements in the group. This will be equal to one. So any four elements in the group. Basically saying that we can commute uh, the commutators. And the variety of group uh, is close under the taking subgroup, taking quotient and taking direct product. So we can define the first, we can define the relative free group, uh, which happens to be the free group in the absolute sense, quotient is second zero subgroup. So the free group of rank K is, uh, uh, the free meta abelian group of rank K is isomorphic to the free group of rank K quotient, uh, the free, the second derived subgroup of it. Okay. So then what we have is we can define the presentation. So in the same fashion as we define presentation for general group is that we can find uh, a, an epimorphism. So subjective homomorphism from the free abelian group into the group G. Suppose G is generated by K elements. Uh, then we can say that if the generating set is x1 to xk, then we consider the normal closure of such subjective map. And the, the kernel is always be a normal subgroup. So it, this is a normal subgroup inside the free meta group. And if you remember that we say the finite generated meta group has the maximum condition for a normal subgroup, which means any normal subgroup is a, just a normal closure of a finite set. So this kernel is a normal closure of a finite set. We say this set, we choose one of them to be R1 to Rm, and we get a presentation, a nice presentation. So this is the generating set, and this is the relators. And I mark this sub subscription here to indicate we are taking the presentation relative to the variety of meta being groups. Basically, we have, we have like all the commutators commutes. So that's something not written out, but you can think now every, everything commutes, every commutator is commutes. Okay, since we define the presentation and we, then we just define the area and then function in the same way. So let's see, we still have a word, I give you any word and we have final presentation. So for a uh, relative final presentation with the generating set is K. So if this word is equals to one, it, you can always decompose it into the product of conjugates of relators, right? It's the same as the usual case. But in this case, what's different is we're taking the equality inside the free meta group. So we're no longer taking in the free group. Uh, 
what what does it mean? It means that for the from the right hand side to the left hand side, you now not only allowed to cancel all the consecutive inverse. So x x inverse you can cancel them, but you can also allow to just commute any two commutators, any two consecutive commutators. If you see two consecutive commutators inside this, you can just commute them. But with some uh, some translation, you you eventually will recover w. So that's the difference from the uh, usual the function and this. So now we say that still the same. We take the smallest l to be the area. Okay. So we we say that it's a relative area is the smallest l uh, with respect to uh, this presentation, and we define the relative dome function with respect to this presentation to be this. So we're taking uh, the words equal to one. Yeah, I think this is a mis a typo here. So uh, if w in g equals one and the length of w is less or equal to n, we're taking the maximum area it bounds, a uh, relative area it bounds. But uh, we just define the relative term function with respect to the presentation. But, but as you might expect, it is independent under this equivalence class, under this equivalence re relation. So uh, Fu proved that uh, if G to be a finite generated uh, metaplane group with two different finite uh, relative presentations, uh, their term function are the same. Also, uh, I add one corollary is that if you take the finite index subgroup, uh, still you have the same relative term function uh, up to equivalence. Uh, therefore, we can define the relative term function. Okay, the relative term function is a term function which is a relative term function of any its finite relative presentation. So that's nice. Uh, we have nice, def well defined relative term function. So let us just see some examples, see what happened for the relative term function. Okay, so the first one is the risk product of two finite generated abelian group. So you take two uh, finite generated abelian group. So the risk product is actually is, you take the main, the B copies of A and semi dual product with B. So that's the risk product. Um, those type of group, if A, B are finite generated, uh, has a polynomial relative term function. So depends on depending on the rank of torsion free rank of A and B. And the second example also our old friend Bamsa Solita group, the BS12. In this case, if you take the relative term function, you just have linear. So linear relative term function. We used to have two to the n as a term function, so it collapsed to the linear function. And it makes sense because we now inside the variety of meta billion group, we are allowed to commute any two commutators. So we are allowed to do, do many, many more things without any charge. So it makes sense the function collapse into a linear. And the third class of group uh, is basically the, the, like the relative bumps are solita group. So we take the relative presentation of the bumps are solita group generated by AT and A to the N Conjugate by t is a to the m, but here we inside our uh, variety of meta group. So if m is greater than two, uh, m is n equal to m plus one, then it has at most cubic term function, a relative term function. So as you might see, okay, this has very small, like small relative term function because we introduce all the meta abelian relation. So then the result might surprise you uh, about the relative term function. So that's my result to estimate the upper bound of the relative term function. And it looks identical, basically identical to the result for the, for the term function. Only difference here, now we just talk about finite generated because, uh, because every finite generated middle group is finite presentable inside this variety. And also here is the relative term function and still has n square if k is zero and k is defined to be the same minimal torsion free rank. And it is two to the n to the two k if k is zero. So one question, why? Why they, 
it does not make sense. We add so many relations where they have the same upper bound, at least through my computation. So let me just try to explain this to you, okay? So the first theorem I say, I prove that that the meta billionness of a finite presented meta billion group holding cost exponential. So what it means is the area of such world. So such world is any four elements inside the group. We take the commutators of commutator, commutators. The area of this is just bounded by two to the length of this world. So what it means is even though we add so many relations for the relative presentation, but they only save exponentially cost. So compared to the, this upper bound, it, it is small, even though we save a lot, but it's small compared to the, the bound. So that's why we don't have, we have the same upper bound. And I will also like explain why we have the two to the entry of two K. Okay. And then Can I the second, a uh, second, yeah, please. So it, it's obvious that the relative is bounded above by the usual Dane function? Yes, yes, that's, yes, yes, you're right. Absolutely oh, sorry. right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's my second result. <laughs> that's if G happens to be finite presented. Okay, if G happens to be finite presented, we can have this uh, relation between the relative dumb function and dumb function. So the dumb function sits inside the relative dumb function and it is bounded by the maximum from this and the exponential function. Okay. So let's try to explain why, where the two to the n to the two k comes from. Okay, let me try to do that. But we have to set up uh, everything. So if we are giving a finite presented meta bin group, and we say that G is a an extension of a bidding group A normal subgroup, and the free bidding group T of finite rank. So here we only consider the free free meta bidding a free bidding group because if, for example, if we have like, if this T is not free abelian, we can always find a finite index subgroup inside G such that this group is a free abelian. And everything preserved under this because it's finite index, the then function is the same, the relative then function is the same. And also you can prove the minimum K is the same. So everything is preserved. So we pass through this nice case. So now we assume that, always assume that T is free abelian and this T is a finite set such that the image, image of this is form a basis for the free abelian group. And the A just a set you know, generates the normal subgroup. It's normal closure of A and also it contains all the commutators of T. So the picture is like this. So we have a, a short in that sequence and where A is a normal closure of A1 to AAM and T is generated by pi, y, pi T I. So all the pi T I, so pi is a quotient map. Okay, so that's the setup. And from the theorem by Barry Strabo, what nice about the theorem is we can write down the presentation. So, so now we have a presentation to work with. So let me uh, briefly explain everything. So generally set just A1 to AM and T1 to TK. And we have four different class of relations. The first one is uh, the TI, TJ commute, the commutator of TI, TJ is AIJ and AIJ is some element inside A1 to AM. So I know it's a bad notation, but AIJ is one of the A1 to AM. So the M can be very large. Uh, the second uh, class of relation is basically everything in A commutes because A is a billion group. So we have some, we need some relation to make A a billion. So basically A commutes with B con conjugate by U, where AB is inside A and U is inside F bar. So F bar, you can think about F bar is a set look like this. So T1, N1, T2, N2, and to the TK, NK. So NI is inside Z. So th this is a set of F bar. So it's like organize every T. So even though T is not a commute, but we can sort of organize it uh, into the nice world. And the third condition basically means that the, the sum of the absolute value for all such NI is bounded by R. So we have only we have finite many relations in the second class. So they are just 
find them anyway, only consider uh, up to R. The third class, uh, you, you might look, it looks complicated, but basically it says that the, this set, the lambda is coming from the Barry Strabo theorem. So if you remember that if A is a TAM T module, we have a nice finite set, satisfy some conditions, but uh, this, this is the set. And so basically this relation tells you the lambda X on A is A. So lambda is a centralizer. Also the second class of, of second part of the R3 is basically lambda star X on A is A. Uh, let me write this way. So, cause lambda star is like right module. So it's, this is the left module, this is the right module. But that's, that's basically those two set of relation tells you, you just have centralizer. Okay. And the fourth part is a finite set. We don't know what exactly look like because it depends on A. Uh, the, the normal closure of R3 and R4 is exactly equal to A. So we don't know what, what it looks like, but we know that it's a normal subgroup. So it's generated by, uh, it's a normal closure of finite set. So we have a finite set uh, inside A. Okay, so that's a setup. So, the, to estimate the upper bound of them function. So there are many, uh, one like straightforward way, just you just solve the word problem. Okay, you give a word and try to convert it to one and count how many relation you use. So that's my idea. Okay, we'll give a word with length n and which this word happens to be identity. Uh, you can write it as a word uh, as basically each ui is an element, is a word in T and all the bi, just some elements in A uh, plus or minus one. Okay, so the thing is we can do some, basically we want to convert this W into a nice normal form of the world because always better to work with some nice normal form. So we eventually from W, we, we convert it to W4, so everything Inside this, you can ignore, but eventually from W, we, we, trans, uh, we convert it to W4. So W4 look like uh, a word like A to the mu one, A2 to the mu two, and AM to the mu M. Each mu I is inside the group ring. Okay, so it's a nice word written from A1 to AM. And what, what nice, uh, and the, the sixth step, what I wrote, basically tells you from W1 to W4, we cause exponentially many relation with respect to N. But the, this is the, where the two to the N, to the two K comes from. So we have a, like the two to the N to the two K. So why? Okay, so let's, next slide, I will explain this. So here is why. If we consider, so now this, this looks like a very nice element and basically you can think it is a module element in, inside the free module in, generated by A1 to AM. And each coefficient is mu1, mu2, and mu m. Uh, every mu i, remember that uh, it is inside the ZT. So it's in the, inside the ZT module. And it's a nice, it has expression of this. And if we think like the relations R3 and R4, if we think also as a module element inside the module, it will, let's write it as F1 to FL. So if the word is one, basically means it slides in the normal closure of this set. And it is same as saying it is equal, it is less in the sub module generated by, generated by the element. Because our action is conjugation, right? So the sub module is the same as normal subgroup, normal closure. Okay, so basically it's saying that if we have a word like this, we want to decompose it into like alpha one, F one, alpha two, F two, and to alpha L, F L. So we are solving the membership problem over the module, over the free module, a ZT module, where T is a free abelian group. And we solving the membership problem for this sub module. Also, you can think it is a word problem for the quotient. So if you say, so actually A is isomorphic as a module, it's isomorphic to, sorry, 
is the free module quotient by the sum module generated by R3 and R4. But anyway, we now have the membership problem. And this membership problem is where we have the two to the n to the two K. So at least the algorithm I found, so I first find a very huge algorithm which you, you can have a iterate uh, exponential function. So, and then I found another algorithm like the, I use a group basis to solve the world, uh, the membership problem. And uh, that's nice, that works nice, uh, beautifully, but the upper bound is still too large, but that's the best I can get. And I hope if anyone knows, we have a better algorithm to solve the membership problem for this group ring, we can like shrinking down the upper bound. But so far it's like this. And this is why we have two to the n to the two K. And this is also why, uh, first of all, the why the bumps are sort of group has very small relative term function because its module structure is very simple. So the membership part of the module, remember that, uh, let me just write down the bumps are sort of group. So A conjugate by T is A squared. So basically it's a sum, it's idea generated by T minus two, right? So it's T is same as two. So it's the element, it's like idea generated by, T minus two. So the, the, the module membership problem is simple. And once we replace add all the, all the meta billion relation, this part just collapse from exponential to linear. So we don't have complicated module structure. So that's why the relative term function collapse. And also it, it also explains why the all the risk product of uh, all the re relative dumb function of risk product also have polynomial like small dumb function because their module structure is also simple. It's quite, it's not as as complicated and as you can get. But but basically what I'm saying that if you define the dumb function of the module, uh, you can prove that the dumb function of a group is always has a lower bound of this dumb function of the module. So A, a is a quotient of the free module by the, uh, by the sum module. But so, so let, let me just talk about some open problems. So the first open problem, like throughout the talk, I wonder if we can have the exponential upper bound. So if we can have exponential upper bound or the relative function, if it has the exponential upper bound for done function, it basically tells you the relative term function also bounded by exponential function. So uh, here's a thumb result might indicate this is correct. Uh, so let me just call, record that Cornelia and Tessera, uh, they put in 2017, uh, one of the consequence of the result is all the polycyclic, uh, polycyclic meta building group. Uh, has at most uh, exponential term function. So at most exponential term function. But there are many, many uh, metabolic group which is not uh, polycyclic. For example, the Bamsar group is not uh, polycyclic. It contains Z response Z. Uh, the, other th the other thing I want, and so, so if this is not true, so suppose we have a relative, we have a meta bank group which has the function bigger than exponential function. How do we find it? So it just go back to the membership problem of the module. If we can find a such a, a sum module with complicated uh, complicated membership problem, we can maybe we can construct a complicated like the meta bank group with a bigger than function than exponential. But, but the, another obstruction is even if we find such, like we find a module such as the, the done function, sorry, the done function of the module is strictly greater than two to the n, even if we find such module. But still we need to make sure A is 10 because we want finite presented group. So even if we find such module is still uh, not guaranteed we can find a nice finite presented beta being group such that its then function is greater, greater than exponential. So that's another obstruction. But let me just uh, uh, stop for, the, uh, for this. 
but we talk about another interesting uh, open problem for the done functions of, of uh, metablin groups. So the question asked ask, ask by uh, Ajahn Tawa and Olsen uh, in 2000, if I remember correctly. So it says that if a finite generated metablin group can be embedded into a finite presented metablin group with polynomial done function. Okay, so first uh, look at the problem. You may ask why we, why we ask this question. So why we ask if it can be embedded into such groups? Uh, here is two ingredients. So the first, I already told you that a finite generated metablin group can be always embedded into a finite presented one. So that's the first part of this conjecture. The second part comes from this. So the world problem of finite generated metablin group is in log space because it's a group of matrices. Uh, in particular, it's inside NP. It can be solved uh, by a non-deterministic Turing version in polynomial time. So uh, one theorem by uh, Birgit, Oshansky, Rips, and Sapir, they prove that uh, the world problem of the finite generated group is in MP if and only if it can be embedded into a finite presented group with polynomial done function. So this conjecture basically want to combine those two properties of, of, of groups, combine it together. And we have many positive results for this. So let me just uh, briefly write you for some, for example, the bumps are solitary group, the BS1Q, if Q is a natural number greater than two, embeds into a group uh, with, first of all, it's made a billion. And the then function of it is uh, less or equal to N squared. So this is, I believe is proved by a uh, and Tessera. And also it is, if you like restrict this embedding to quasi-isometric embedding, it can be embedded into a metablin group with a uh, cubic then function. This is proved by uh, Ajahn Sawa and Olsen. And also we can see, if you remember that the lamp lighter group, it, it is infinitely related, right? If it, it is infinitely related, but it embeds into gamma M, where gamma M has, to, has uh, at most uh, n to the four, right? So there are many groups already embeds into like nice uh, finite presented polynomial then functions. So can we ask if they all have these such properties, such property? Uh, but I, I don't think it's true. So uh, first uh, I prove this. So I prove this, uh, this one of my theorem is that every race product of free abelian group with a finite generated abelian group embeds into a group which is a billion, oh, sorry, which is meta billion and has exactly exponential done function. And I, I suspect that some, some group like this or some group like this cannot be embedded into a meta billion group with, finite, uh, with polynomial done function, but we will see. Uh, I hope we will see. Uh, I guess that's all I want to tell. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now, if there are any questions to the speaker, uh, you're welcome to ask them. Uh, so about problem B, uh, like if you okay. take exact, yeah, me... uh, if you take just exact the Baum's Lux construction, uh, by the way, this is like this result of Baum's Lab of 1973. This is also a result of Remislenikov the same year. Like it's usually referred yes. to Remislenikov. Um, it's, uh, so if you take this construction, what happens to the N function? It is the same. Like if you embed, like to take the embedding construction from Baum's Lab's paper. Okay. Yeah. So actually this, my result is based on his construction. So this group actually is constructed by him. And it has uh -huh. exponential then function if you just consider this. Uh, but the thing is complicated. So if you want to embed arbitrary meta billion group, so what he do is first uh, embed into a risk product of groups, which has some quotient here. Mm -hmm. so, so here we have some quotient inside this part. So this part, the module structure become very complicated. 
So I did not compute that. I just compute the easier case if just two raised product, uh, or raised product. And it turns out his group has exponential term function. Mm -hmm. The so other the case, case, I think, yeah. Okay, and then and I think question, th this, uh, yeah, yeah. Have you ever considered like uh, thought about the average then function in this? Like there is this Gromov's notion and uh, uh, the work by Robert Young, um, who is doing average uh, then function for metabolian groups. Did you like? Is it does it make sense to do it with? Uh, sorry, for for nilpotent groups. Does it make sense to do it with metabolian groups? Uh, I think what you refer to is like the centralized then function or like the- No, I've, average, uh, like, I mean, there are random, basically what it is average in the group, like. Okay, it's a ra random word and consider random, the yeah, and then consider function. Basically like every... how it's average because for some words it is- Okay, okay, yeah, large, for yeah some that makes sense. It's yeah. more than what it is in average. Um, just interesting whether it's like whether it's decreasing. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I haven't look look at it. I will try to look at it later. So, yeah, because neopotent group uh, is basically behave nicer, much nicer than beta beta group. Like it has polynomial yeah, function and mm -hmm. yeah. But nevertheless, I mean, in neopotent groups also the function becomes yes. smaller when you average it. Uh, so it okay. is just interesting, oh, interesting. It's going to be uh, your boundary if okay. you average the function over the group. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Very, very interesting uh, talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great talk. Thank you. And great, great theorem. Um, so a okay, couple, thank of you. couple of questions. Why, why, okay. um, why again, do you think Z read Z won't uh, embed into a, um, a metabolian, finely presented metabolian group with uh, polynomial Dane function? What's uh, uh, here is uh, the, the, my guess uh, because uh, there is one notion is called the centralized Dane fun function. So we yeah. model. So for example, if sorry, uh, if G is a group as a morphe to a free group, um, quotient is norm the normal subgroup. And we can model out all the relation uh, by so basically centralize all the relation. So in the in the expression, right? So now if we have the conjugates of of relators, now it becomes if we take the the same equality in the in this, everything will commute. So F just cancels, right? So R F I F I inverse just cancel. So what's left? Just some R, some copies of R. And uh, what is this? Uh, is what is interesting of this is it can give you a like look. It looks like kill many many things. Uh, but it turns out you have some groups, some neopotent group with exponential function. Uh, it was exactly same centralized function, centralized then function and then function. And also this case happened to also apply to. Metabolian group. You also have some metabolian group with the same centralized then function and the then function. So, and what is interesting about the centralized then function because it relates to the second homology of this group. So it's second homology, and the the technique to show this uh, thing basically to find basically uh, the bumps are. I, I guess there's a paper from bumps are Miller and short. Uh, they, they use like find an element of infinite order inside this second homology, infinite order. And to do something like with this, with this element. So what it means, for example, this group, it has second homology, you can compute the second homology. And because it embeds into a finite presenting metabolian group, it guarantees that you have, definitely you have an infinite, you have an infinite order element inside the second homology. So, this embedding and you can have a subjective map from the second homology of this group to this group, right? So it basically guarantee you can find such element. And if we compute the centralized then function, maybe, and also the centralized then function gives you the lower bound. 
So that's my guess. If you can do something with the second homology and you can show the centralized then function is exponential. And then you can, it implies that the whole then functions should be exponential. So that's, so I haven't uh, proved this. So just my guess. Can I ask? I hope this answer your question. Yes, well, yes, thank you. Can I ask something di rather different? Um, at, at, the okay. heart, at the heart of your Dane function upper bound theorem, uh, you said uh, yeah. was the um, membership problem for um, a uh, was it a, a, a sub module of a, um, of a free module? Um, you know, it, yes. there's a, there's, a, there's a big there's a big um, commutative algebra literature on um, these sorts of uh, membership problems or particularly ideal membership problems, and I, I I'm not clear whether what you've what your the the problem you're finding at the heart of your issues. It is something that's already been looked at. Is 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 there is there other yeah. other things in that literature that can illuminate what you're doing, or um, or or, yeah. just, or give lower bound, or give worst examples, or that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I hope so. So I look look up in the literature. I found a lot of results. Uh, first, many results for the uh, the polynomial ring for the Q or the R X, but R cases. Kind of like difference is zx, and also we are consider the consider uh, basically the module. So there is uh, one theorem by uh, Mayer and and Meyer. So mm -hmm. they prove something like the idea, the idea membership problem of idea inside this zx. The general problem is exponentially hard, like at least take exponential space. But their problem is different from what I consider because I consider just fix the generators and find the membership problem. Or find the membership problem. They they basically as a general mm -hmm. general problem. Basically, you give all the elements. Sure. So this as an input, and you, so it does not guarantee you have the same same generator of the idea to guarantee you have the exponential hard. So that's as far as I know, but. I'm not sure for this is, and also they have very, they have many nice upper bound for, this is exponentially hard. So if we restrict to our field, to a field, to a field over, over a field, but I don't know if, what if, what happened if we replace it by Z, because it looks much harder when you- There is a, there is a paper, paper by Ashenbrenner uh, on the case over Z, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's quite, it's again, the same problem as your, um addressing. Okay. Yeah, I hope we can find a better algorithm. So I will look, also I will look here. Uh, All right, are there any other questions? Okay, let us send the speaker again. Thank you very much. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, so now that I managed to switch to my uh, uh, main computer, I'll stop the recording now. One moment. <laughs>